Welcome, everybody. Uh, our presentation tonight is Community Crisis Response. Thank you for joining us. Um, this meeting will be recorded as Don requested. Uh, please use the Q&A box if you have any questions. And if you have any comments, just use the chat feature if you can, please. All right. Okay, so um, who are we? So this is, you know, we are, this is the implementation, implementation team for the Community Crisis Response Program. And I just wanna introduce everybody here. Um, we have LaShonda White, who's the Director of Community Services. Good evening, everyone. Welcome mm -hmm. and thank you for coming tonight. Um, also on this, this team is the interim fire chief, Michael Smith, and fire chief, is it Angel or Angel? Oh, you say it pretty good, so you can stay with Angel. Angel Montoya, <laughs> fire chief Angel Montoya. We also have Lieutenant uh, Eric Smith from RPD, uh, and our wonderful task force member, Kristen Killian Lobos. Hey everyone, good evening. Um, we also have another task force member of Captain, retired Captain Joey Schlemmer from RPD. Are you with us, Joey? Doesn't look like he's with us tonight. And you have myself, task force member Marcus Injasang, and community member Sarah Cantor. Everyone. Also, intern Amara Emma. I don't know if I'm if anybody can correct me on that. Emma um, is also on the on the team. So that's who we are. That's we're representing the um, representing the. Okay. So next, please. Okay. So what are the objectives for tonight? Uh, for the community crisis response team, our objectives are to share information. Uh, we also would love some feedback on the proposed work and to make sure we are pointing in the right direction. Uh, we desire to meet the needs of the community and to develop and uh, implement a program that people need, but also will want and will use, which is very important. Uh, we're also gonna hear some personal stories on uh, to honor lived experiences. Okay, so um, what's on the agenda for tonight? Um, we're going to have a poll to see who's in the room. Also give some background um, and frequently asked questions. Where are we now? Uh, and also there's going to be a panel of some individuals who have some lived experience uh, with this, with community, uh, behavioral health system and and what are we going to do next we have 40 minutes to talk about that and there's also going to be a q a um for anybody who has any questions and we have some answers for you regarding this so introducing next will be shonda white and she's going to give you all a poll all right. Well, once again, LaShonda White, I am the interim director for community services here in Richmond and have been part of the uh, task force committee uh, focused on community crisis response and trying to develop that program. And it has been a pleasure to work with um, task members and city staff on this project. And so we wanted to just get a sense of who's in the room, who's on this who's participating in this uh in this session with us today so we have two questions for you we hope that everyone can participate we're going to give about a minute for each poll um but there are two questions the first one is have you personally experienced mental health or substance use challenges yourself um, and then you'll have some options yes no or you decline to state um, you have the right to do that and then we will share what the results are of that poll and then we have the other 
another question with regards to have you supported a loved one? Because we understand that um, that is another component. We are, there are many of us who are experiencing or have experienced uh, these challenges, but we also may um, have a loved one that we have supported um, during that uh, as well. So I'm going to launch the first poll. I hope everyone is ready. It should be simple. And first question, here we go. So see the numbers, we have 16 responses. We have 45 people on the call. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna give it a few more seconds, maybe 15 more seconds. We have 33. Look, I need like the Jeopardy music. Okay, all right. So we have 33 responses in. I'm gonna end the poll and I am going to share the results. Can you all see the results from the poll? So who's in the room? So um, of the 33 individuals who decided to respond, and thank you so much for that, um, 20 or of uh, the 33 or 61% have personally experienced mental health or substance use challenges. And uh, 13 uh, of the 33 or 39% have not. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing this one. And then I'm going to go to uh, question number two. And I'm gonna launch that one. Have you supported a loved one through mental health or substance abuse challenges? You guys are so quick. Thank you so much for being engaged and participating. We really appreciate that. I'm going to give it just 10 more seconds. Okay, last call. All right. So I'm going to end this poll and then I will share the results. So here we see that um, before we had um, in the 60% range, I think it was 61% that personally had experienced mental health or substance abuse challenges. And now we see um, with our question about have you supported someone that you love, whether that be a friend, a family member through mental health or substance abuse challenges, we see that percentage increase to 84%. Um, so more of us have um, in, uh, had had the experience of supporting someone that we love um, through that. So I don't know if Kristen, Marcus, or Sarah wanna comment on our poll results, but I will allow them to do so. All right, well, thank you all so much uh, for sharing with us today. Yeah, I'll just say something about it. Um, thank you everyone for responding. I, I think that what this shows is that this is not something that's rare. This is something that many of us are, are facing in our families and our communities and our loved one, with our own loved ones, um, our own selves. So. Uh, and that, and I think you'd find that probably in any town, not just Richmond, right? So um, this is this is why the need is so great. And um, I know this is just kind of like you know those of us who showed up on a rainy, <laughs> you know, stormy uh, Wednesday evening, but um, for this topic, but it, it's still really telling, and um, that so many of us have have experienced this this issue we're discussing tonight. So thank you for showing up. All right, um, I'm gonna move on to the next part. So um, I'm, again, I'm Sarah. I'm a community member who has been supporting this project um, since before it was even a proposal. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be here and to be on this team. So I'm gonna start out with a little bit of the background, how we got here. 
Um, so as folks may know, the Reimagining Public Safety Task Force was created in June 2020 in response to public demand for the city to, um, to respond to the murder of George Floyd and what it um, indicates about what that murder indicated about the racial um, reality that we're living in. And there specifically was public comment asking for non-police crisis response teams. So there was a task force subcommittee, the health and safety subcommittee um, that designed and proposed a program based on existing programs in other cities. So for example, CAHOOPS in Eugene, MACRO in Oakland, Mental Health First in Sacramento and Oakland were kind of the three main, um, the three main inspirations for this program. So the program was approved and, um, and given funding in May of 2021. And the implementation team to figure out really like how do we turn this proposal into an actual program has been meeting since July of 2021. So we've been meeting for about six months now. And the goal is to create a crisis response program that meets the needs of the Richmond community. And so then I'm gonna go into a little bit of FAQ. And so these are some questions that we've received frequently about the program. Um, and hopefully your question is on here. If it's not, please, please, please ask any questions that you want to um, just put them in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer them um, as quickly as we can, whether that is answering them live or via the Q&A box. Um, but really wanna make sure that we are responding to whatever questions you have. So the first question, um, why, why, why are we doing this? Why are we developing this program? Um, COVID-19 and has really um, exacerbated some national crises that have been occurring um, and are continuing around specifically suicide and substance use um, rates of suicide and of um, harm due to substance use have really risen during the pandemic, and this is a major issue that needs addressing. And there also, this also is a, in a response to a larger conversation about the potential danger of police response to mental health crisis. We've seen um, instances of people who are experiencing mental health crisis, and then the police respond, and it can um, turn out to um, be, it can, it, they can turn deadly or um, injurious. It can injure people also. And there was specifically a public ask for more options to respond to community needs, that we have a few options, it's not enough. And yeah, so just seeing um, a question in the chat here, if you can pop that question in the Q&A box, that will be really helpful, thanks. Uh, the next question, what will the program do? We're gonna provide in the moment crisis support. So either over the phone or coming out to somebody's location in person for Richmond residents in need. What kinds of situations will the program respond to? So we use as an umbrella term, behavioral health crisis. That includes a mental health crisis, substance use crisis, trauma responses that somebody might be going through, basically anything that where somebody needs support in the moment and there it doesn't fall under the purview of needing um, police or fire or something like that. Uh, how a really common question we get is how are people going to access the program? And so we have worked out that there's going to be two options. So one will be via 911. Um, people can just call 911 directly and um, get the, the dispatcher will talk to them about the situation and can then forward the call along to this crisis response program. There will also be a standalone line for anyone who prefers to not go through 911 dispatch, who wants to just call the line directly and make sure that they get this specific program and don't get rerouted to a different department. And so both of those will be in place. So if somebody does not want to, if somebody does not want to um, memorize a new number, they can just use 911. If someone doesn't want to use 911, they can use the new number. 
right? Who will be on the response team? We're gonna have two community response specialists on each team. One that has additional mental health training and experience. So maybe a social worker, a licensed marriage and family therapist, somebody who has some like real additional training in how to respond to mental health crisis and has experience with that. And then somebody who, the the next role is somebody who has lived experience of behavioral health crisis. So this is a peer support role. So recognizing that when you're in crisis, often the best thing is to be able to talk to somebody else who has been in that same crisis and gotten out of it and um, get that, the peer support is um, invaluable. And the intention is to prioritize candidates who already have deep connections to the Richmond community. So when we're hiring, really making sure that we are um, elevating the community, the leaders that we already have in our community. All right, so what will the team do? How will they actually respond to crises? So the response team will, of course, listen to the person in crisis. They'll assess any physical needs that they have. Maybe they're dehydrated. They need to be warmed up, um, things like that. Assess any emotional and mental needs that they might have. De-escalate any conflicts that are occurring. Often um, behavioral health crisis can be accompanied by a lot of conflict. They'll provide support and compassionate care and connect folks with additional ongoing resources. And um, the reason that we can't provide like more specific, like they will do this and then this and then this is that every response is gonna look different. Everybody who's in crisis needs something slightly different. And so it's um, not, uh, so it's, we can't, we can't say exactly what will happen at each situation, but our team will get a lot of training and I will go back to that. Um, I just saw a question on the chat about, I'm just going to go back really quickly to the, how will people access the program? Saw a question in the chat about um, the 988 mental health response number being rolled out. So um, that is um, not a, it's not intended as a 911 alternative. What that is, is the 988 is it's the national um, suicide hotline is getting an easier number to remember. So instead of having to remember that long number, you can just dial 988 and that will either go to a, so counties get to decide where that number goes. So it'll either go toward a county run mobile response program or some sort of response program, or it will go to the national suicide response, suicide prevention hotline. And so that is a a different thing. Um, That's how people will be able to connect to county or national resources, not our city resource. But thank you for asking that. All right. So another common question, Um, will the team work with law enforcement? And um, really important, we are designing this so that the team will only work with um, law enforcement when necessary. So that would look like either the person in crisis um, is requesting or somebody who is trying to support is requesting police presence really explicitly, or there's an active threat of violence. Um, So somebody is brandishing a weapon and declaring an intent to use it against somebody else. A common reason that um, police could be called in this situation is for um, when the folks who are supporting believe that the person who's in crisis really needs to be held involuntarily at some sort of psychiatric institution. That's referred to as a 5150 hold in um, California. And so what we have learned through our work with the county is that there are county behavioral health specialists who are able to to issue those holds. And so for that circumstance, if that's necessary for any reason, we don't need to rely on the police department. We can reach out to the county and they will be able to support with getting those holds issued. All right. Another really common question, saw this question in the, um, in the Q&A also. Um, and so that is how will we work with Contra Costa County and other resources? So Contra Costa County has the new um, A3 program that uh, Gail mentioned in the Q&A, and that stands for anytime, anyone, 
anytime, anywhere. And it's they're displaying their intention to be able to respond to any crisis in the county um, at any time of day, as opposed to their current program, which only operates during certain hours and um, doesn't have a huge amount of capacity to be able to respond to everyone necessarily. So they're developing some new teams. Um, they're developing the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub and they're developing new places to go. So um, I mentioned psychiatrics holds earlier. Um, psychiatric institutions, hospitals are often right now the only option that folks have when they need additional support during a crisis of a place to go. And so the city is, or sorry, the county is working on developing new options, things like um, sobering centers. So if somebody is um, has a, uh, is having a substance use crisis and just needs to get, um, just needs to have a safe place to sober up, that will be an option. Um, one, something that I haven't heard specifically mentioned at the county level, but another, uh, another type of alternative destination is a, what's called a respite center where people um, can go and yeah, peer support centers as well, um, where when folks are having a crisis, they can, um, uh, they can, so when somebody is having a crisis, they can go there and kind of ride it out and not need to be in an institution necessarily. So we're meeting with county staff regularly. We're in regular conversation with them. We're kind of developing our, um, we um, were um, developing our programs at the same time. We're not the only city that's developing a citywide program instead of just responding to, um, instead of just linking up with the county. So both Antioch and San Ramon are developing their own citywide programs as well. And so we've been working with the county, trying to figure out how exactly we can partner with them. And they're, with the stage that they're at in their program development, um, they're not ready to commit to any specific partnerships yet. They are saying like, yes, we would love to, um, we would love to work together. We want to make sure that that we're all working together. They're really in support of us having our own city team and want to make sure that they link, but haven't been able to commit to anything specific there. And then in terms of how we're, um, in terms of, oh, so I see a question about the hub. Is it being developed in Richmond? Um, I don't believe that the hub is going to, um, is, uh, going to be located in Richmond. Um, it's going to be located somewhere east of us, um, but definitely will we'll serve Richmond for anyone who wants to access county resources instead of our city program. And so in terms of how we'll work with um, um, the, so also um, working with other community-based organizations, so we're you know, trying to create strong partnerships between community-based organizations on this program for referrals so that um, you know, when we come across maybe a youth who needs a lot of support, um, they could be referred to the RES Center, for example. And so the staff in this program are going to do referrals, do follow up, make sure that people know about resources that they can be connected to, um, but will not provide case management services. This program is not intended to um, provide a, like to provide a ongoing um, support. It's just more intended for crisis and then follow up. Um, Next was what kind of training will the staff receive? So training, the staff will receive training in harm reduction, including overdose interruption and reversal um, using Narcan, Naloxone, basic first aid, de-escalation skills, negotiation and motivational interviewing. So basically two different ways to kind of shift some, if someone is saying like, I really, you know, need to, stay locked in this room by myself, being able to potentially move somebody to a different place around that. Um, Trauma-informed information about mental health, uh, training on cultural competency, focusing specifically on racial equity and our particular context here in Richmond, recognizing that Richmond is really different than a lot of places. And we have a really specific need and a really 
specific incredible community here. Uh, train, they'll receive training on those local resources that we just talked about, other um, community-based organizations, training on relevant laws, liability, et cetera. And then a really important one is making sure that they have support around self-care and secondary trauma. Anyone who works um, with people who are in crisis knows that it can be um, very difficult to, to kind of take on all of that day after day. So making sure that we're not creating more crisis um, among the people who are helping to respond. All right, um, what data will the program collect? Will it be shared? So this is something that we're still kind of figuring out the details on, but um, I got this question from somebody specifically about um, for undocumented folks, like will this program be able to work with undocumented folks? And um, what about medical insurance? So it's not a medical program. So no medical insurance info will be needed or gathered. Um, whether someone is insured or not will not be relevant. So basic info like name, um, location, telephone number will be gathered for internal use. So making sure that, you know, if this is the fourth time we're going out to see someone that the team knows about the previous calls so that we can see like what worked, what didn't work. Um, what does this person need? What do we know? And then um, it's really important for us to be transparent, report out to the community how the program's working. So non-identifying information about like demographics, outcomes, things like that will be shared with community. Um, but again, no one case will be shared. It'll be aggregated non-identifying info. And um, then Richmond is a sanctuary city, so we will not share any info with ICE whatsoever. All right, and now I'm going to pass it on to Kristen for our panel. And thank you all so much for your questions. Going to come back to those in the Q&A session. Thank you, Sarah. Hey, everyone. Um, so I was, you know, really um, grateful that we would uh, have some speakers tonight be able to share their own experience, um, you know, their own um, stories, their own lived experience of either needing mental health crisis, being in crisis, having a family member in crisis. And we have three people here to share their stories. And I really want to honor them. Um, it's, it takes a lot of bravery to share your personal story in a public forum. Um, I think it's a little, for me, I've done it a few times. I think it's more challenging on Zoom. <laughs> so I just really want to um, create a space for them to share and feel uh, comfortable doing that. And so we have three panelists tonight. We have Aaron Williams. He's one of the fellows at the Safe Return Project here in Richmond and um, Mika Herrera also from the Safe Return Project. And then we have Mr. Wanda Joseph from the Yanina Healing Circle. Uh, it's a nonprofit that um, offers families who've been impacted by gun violence here in our community, um, a place for healing. It's a support group that she started after doing a lot of work for years uh, with different organizations, in including um, the uh, ceasefire work here in Richmond. And um, my name is Kristen Killian Lobos. I'm a task force member. I'm also someone with lived experience myself. Um, I uh, had to reach out for help many times when my own daughter was in active addiction and in both mental health crisis, substance use crisis, um, uh, was uh, missing for many, many periods of time. She was an adolescent at the time, so it was incredibly stressful and scary for me. Uh, I didn't have any idea how to navigate systems at the time. I was a single mother, I was on Medi-Cal. Um, a lot of things happened. One time she jumped out of my car just in front of Richmond Kaiser and I didn't see her again for a long time after that. Um, but you know, the best thing that happened during the whole couple of years this was going on for my, my own child and my family was we one time we were on Solano Avenue in crisis in Berkeley and a um I needed help I really needed help and I didn't know there was a crisis team in Berkeley but a crisis counselor showed up and um it was really the first time 
someone explained to me what my daughter was experiencing with her drug use because I didn't know what meth psychosis was. And not only did my daughter, um, after working with the counselor on the street, decide to go back to the hospital and back into treatment, but the counselor asked how I was doing and I was not doing well. And it was the first time anyone ever asked me that. Um, I had dealt with doctors and police and social workers and treatment folks and medical staff and no one ever asked how I was doing. Um, and really that experience made me understand the need for this kind of, of crisis team really in, in every community. It's a very different experience to have a social worker or, or a, someone trained for street crisis response to show up uh, on the scene in the, in the middle of it, in the middle of the stress of it. So, um, so that's how I, I started doing this work. This happened for my family about eight or nine years ago. And now my daughter's um, 26 years old and, and thriving and doing well. And, um, and so now we do this work to help others. So I'm going to start with are our panelists, can I see our panelists? Are they here? Hello? <laughs> oh, I see, I see you, Dewanda. Let's unmute our panelists. Um, okay, and let me get to my questions here. Please, uh, when I introduce our panelists, uh, yeah. say who you are, just you know, take a moment to introduce your own self because you can do that a lot better than I can. Um, so why don't we do that first and then I'm gonna ask you your first question. And we're gonna be very cognizant of time because you know, this, this hour goes by fast. So um, we're just gonna hold it to you know, a minute, minute and a half to, to uh, respond to our questions. So why don't we start with you, Aaron? Just tell us who you are, welcome. Um, how y'all doing tonight? Um, <clears throat> My name is Aaron Williams. Uh, actually, I grew up in Richmond. Um, I work with uh, the Safe Return Project in Richmond. Um, and a um, little bit about myself. Uh, I was one of the troubled youth in Richmond. Uh, ended up going off to prison and coming home, uh, being able to give back uh, to the community with the help of Safe Return. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Um, Micah, hi, introduce yourself to us, please. Good evening, you guys. My name is Mika. I'm a community oh, I organizer. Apologize. I, didn't, I didn't pronounce it correctly, my bad. No worries at all, no worries. Um, I'm a community organizer with Safe Return. Um, a little bit about me is uh, I've been with Safe Return for two years now. Um, and I'm formerly incarcerated. Um, yeah, so I enjoy the work that I do. And that's, that's a little bit about me. All right, thank you for being here. Thank okay, Ms. D, Dewanda, you wanna introduce yourself real quick? Oh, unmute yourself. You My name is Minister Dewanda Joseph, resident of Richmond. I've been uh, working in the community for over 10 years now. I am a mental health first aid rapid responder, and I've had personal experiences also well as community experience around trauma and uh, lack of service response to our community. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome, thank you for being here. Okay, so let's, we've got some questions. Um, and we're just gonna go around in the same order and just take a minute or so. Um, what is your per own personal experience with behavioral health crisis that you want to share with us? And we'll go with you, Aaron. Um, I'm, I mean, my own personal experience with behavioral, behavioral health crisis, uh, I would have to say that it started, uh, you know, as a youth. Uh, you know, growing up in the early 90s, it wasn't no other uh, numbers or, you know, lines that you can call for help or nothing like that. So it was 911. Um, you know, a lot of the situations and issues uh, like substance abuse, uh, dealing with, you know, uh, drugs, alcohol, or just um, physical abuse in the home could have been dealt with differently 
um, if we had had uh, programs like that that existed that's been uh, implemented today. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, okay, Mika, your turn. Um, my personal experience with behavioral health crisis, um, it really varies. I've had, you know, episodes and time that I needed support while I was incarcerated. I've had episodes post-incarceration um, when I come back into the community. Um, so it's been a it's been a roller coaster, and I'm glad that now we're seeing a lot more you know support and people trying to come together to to get it together for our community. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yes. Yes. Wanda, please share with us. Yes, um, I've, my personal experiences include a child, um, female, who was going through some substance and mental health crisis. And when I went into the hospital versus getting treatment at Kaiser Richmond, they called law enforcement in, which escalated the situation that traumatized not only myself, my daughter, but my grandchildren by mm -hmm. the behavior that law enforcement did to myself and my child. Like I said, I work in this community, been doing this over 10 years. When I took my daughter in for services, I was also handcuffed and thrown on a car. You know, um, that was unacceptable because we were at the hospital seeking services and versus getting services, Kaiser chose to call the police. Um, there's been a lot of personal trauma within our community. As I said, I'm a first aid mental health rapid responder. I organized Yanima Healing Circle because of the lack of response to the trauma situations that have taken place in Richmond around the gun violence. So that organization came to be because of the um, gun violence trauma that we weren't getting responses to for people who needed help. Right. Yeah, well, that leads right into the next question, which is when you had that crisis, what helped and what didn't help? What, what was it? Did anything good happen? If not, what what happened? What happened for you personally in in the moment of that crisis? What would you say, Aaron? I would, you know, uh, dealing with calling nine one one. A lot of times, I escalated the situations. Uh, you know, um, me myself personally was removed from the home um, and placed in uh, foster care. Um, you know, uh, not just myself, but my sisters as well. Um, and from there, uh, we never went back home, you know? So I, me, myself personally, went from uh, being placed in foster care uh, as a teenager. Um, I pretty much timed out um, by the time I was 18. Um, and then I hit uh, prison at 18. Okay. So it was no help. <laughs> right, right. Calling 911 just put you into systems that were more traumatizing. Okay, wow. Thank you for sharing that. What, what would you say, Mika? What, what, what? I would say, um, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to give two brief examples. Uh, one from when I was incarcerated, you know, locked in a cell, um, basically voiceless to the outside. So I'm telling, you know, I'm having an episode in the room. I feel I need to talk to mental health. I need to talk to somebody. Um, and the deputies, I tell them, can you please put me on the list so I could be talked to? They just repeatedly lie and say they put you on the list. They don't put you on no list. They just, and so um, that didn't help me at all because it kind of just made me like a ticking time bomb. Um, what did help while I was incarcerated was just having to be strong enough to control my own thoughts, just having enough self-control to um, just know I can't win in that kind of situation. And I had to just basically talk myself, talk myself down a little bit. Um, after the fact in the community, I would say what helped me was reaching out to family members that I know I could talk to. Mm -hmm. because now I'm out here and I can, you know, get a hold of people. Um, what didn't help was not knowing about what resources are available to me um, or anything like that. So that didn't help because I just thought, 
the one or two friends that I have that are, those are the only people I could call on, but there's many more. And um, it wasn't, I didn't learn about that while I was incarcerated. They didn't tell me what I, what resources I had coming home to in my community. Um, so I wasn't educated on it. So I would say that. Yeah. Thank you. What, what, uh, what helped and what didn't help for you? What helped for me was that I became an advocate, um, not only for my child, but also for my community. And that's what I've been doing. I learned how to navigate the system. And then I was able to help people go through the system of care and find services that were needed. I also, I did a lot of work around vetting therapists so that we could have good fits. Um, and I made myself available to anyone in my community who needed that kind of assistance, including doing trauma-informed care um, trainings at Safe Return Project. Uh, what didn't help was law enforcement because I don't feel that they're properly trained for the services when you get a call. They don't have the skill level to respond. I think it was one officer from San Pablo and one from Richmond that was uh, trained in mental health responses and that was it. When um, on the scene, like I said, when they arrested my daughter and put me in cuffs, that's how they handled it. And it was ugly, it was disrespectful, and it disregarded the safety and well-being of everybody in the circle. So while you're causing and creating more havoc, law enforcement did, you're traumatizing other young people who stood on the side and watched their mother and grandmother be handcuffed and mishandled by police officers. Um, learning to work within the system and, and how to get through the loopholes helps me and help my daughter. She was incarcerated also and the trouble she went through, I was able to abdicate along with others who uh, introduced me to people inside the mental health system in the jail system in order to get her services met while she was incarcerated. And I believe that was really helpful for where she is today because she's on track, her life is stable and she's getting all the services she needs. When we don't have proper services in our community and people um, who have mental health issues or are traumatized by the things we seek other ways to relieve ourselves from those pressures, which can lead to the substance abuse or either other types of abuse on other individuals. And the trauma just continues. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I just want to say this real quick. I just want to share this because I wasn't sure if you were going to, what you were sharing this evening, Dewanda, but you and I know each other. And so we talked about this I, my daughter had the same issues as your daughter. Yes. And I took her to the same hospital, Kaiser Richmond, and I was in the exact same location, the parking lot outside the emergency room. And I called the same police department to help me. And she, my mother and I were there together with my daughter. And my daughter was uh, out of control, really. And she really was, I'm not gonna lie. She would, and she was in this meth psychosis state and I wanted her to get in the hospital. But, but I'm telling you, nobody handcuffed me or my mother. Those are your daughter. Respectful. Or my daughter. They got an ambulance for her and took her to Martinez to a psych bed. So 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 this is this is personal for me as well because it it, it does affect it, it makes me angry that that happened to you. And so we can see, you know, that I'm a white mother and that did not happen to me. Mm -hmm. So, and we were in the same location with the same police department. So that, that this is what, you know, we've experienced these things. We know this, this is, this is why we, we do this work. I'm a volunteer and I know, and, and you know, and, I, and this is just important work to me because it, we can see that this is, this is not right. This is not right treatment for our community members. Uh, and that we have disparities and we don't have an equitable system. So I just had to say that. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, so next question. What would have helped? What did you actually need? What, what, what would have, if the, if the, if things had been different, if you could see a different vision, what, what would have helped in your, in your crisis situation? And we're starting again with you, Aaron. Um, I would have to say, uh, actually, uh, something set in place kind of like this right here. Um, because like I said, growing up in the nineties, for me, it wasn't nobody else, but 911, you know, or, 
you know, CPS. They had that, you know what I mean? Um, so we didn't have an outside uh, connection to be, you know, called to come in to handle our trauma or uh, issues that were in the household that could have been dealt somewhat in the household outside of everybody being dragged out of the house mm -hmm. or, you know, out of schools, you know, like growing up, you know, it, it was police on campuses when I went to school. So, you know, we seen our friends or peers being drugged out of classrooms, handcuffed, mm -hmm. you know, so in situations like that, that shouldn't even be seen whether it's, you know, high school, junior high, some, or elementary, because it's happening now in elementary too. Yeah. Yeah. Mika, what, what would you wish to have happened for you? Um, I wish that there was somebody by my side to talk to you know, someone like, like this group, nobody's judging that, you know, you share your story and we, you know, we all don't know each other, but it's all very similar in different ways. So um, I'll say just someone by my side or someone that, you know, can respond to me where I'm at and come talk to me, even a random mental health person, you know, whatever the case is, just someone safe to talk to instead of uh, making it seem like, like I'm in trouble, you know, like I'm doing something wrong. Just someone to talk to. Yeah. First off, I just want to acknowledge Aaron and, and Mika and just thank them both for being here sharing because these are the people, not these, not these, they, Aaron and Mika, my daughters, my grandchildren are the people I stay in community working with. What could help is that we have people within our community who are trusted and able to go into community, deep into community, to be able to have conversations. I heard mention about the type of people we're looking for. Actually, the peers that live in communities where the trauma is the highest would be of great service to our community. Um, their stories just touch my heart because I live in community and I, I have my children here. And when um, services were moved out of West County into East and Central County, we were left with nothing. And the service response time was so slow that it caused more harm. And our only recourse was to reach out to 911. Children have been pulled out of homes for years. A system that was set up to be a temporary relief for family became something that kept families torn apart that re-traumatized young kids. So the system has been broken for a long time. People aren't broken. It's the system. If we can't get services into the communities where it's most needed and our votes don't count and our city council members don't respond to the needs of us, they are jacking us around. And I'm gonna say it just like that. Y'all know what I mean. Because sometimes money comes from places up high and it's not even considering the people in the communities that need the services and monies are going to other sources. I think that we have to, we are our best healers. We are our best supporters. We are our biggest advocates. And it's important that we learn that and become a voice for those who feel or seem to be voiceless. We're not bad people. We're not wrong for what we're asking for, and but we're and we're ready to work for what we need in our communities today, and we are powerful enough to do that. Ooh, thank you. I think I think okay that that you just that's like drop the mic, right? <laughs> so I need to be cognizant of time because woo, we're we're getting we're coming up on it here. Um, I know uh, I'm not sure if. Marcus mentioned like we they only gave us an hour, but we knew we really wanted a little more time than that. So I'm hoping you all can can stay with us, stay here. We've got more 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 to present. Um, but in closing with this, I mean, I I just wow, I'm so moved, you know, um, by what you shared. Thank you, thank you so much, really from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. It's really powerful, really personal. Um, and, and we can't thank you enough for showing up. And I would just want to say, Dewanda's on vacation. So thank you for, for zooming in with us, even though you're, you're on a trip. So 
Thank you so much. And um, I hope to see you all in, in person in the community soon. <laughs> Thank you. What's next on our agenda? All right, so what's next on our agenda is talking about what's next. Um, I wish that we had everyone on as uh, panelists so we could like do a round of applause for and Mika and Delanda. But for those of us who are on here, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really thank you. beautiful and moving. And thank you for the vulnerability. I know that was one more question, but I started, you know, we had to close it up. And thank you, uh, thank you all. Thank you. And all three of you addressed that last question beautifully in your answers. Yeah. So really appreciating you. Um, so this is just a little bit of information about where, you know, we talked about where we've been, where we are now, and this is where we're going. So um, we're still kind of finalizing some pieces about the program design and should be wrapped up with that at the very beginning of 2022. And then we'll get started on the infrastructure creation. So creating job classifications, renting office space, all of the things that the like little moving parts that need to come into place in order to make it an actual functioning program. And the goal is that by mid 2022, the program is ready to serve the Richmond community. Um, so understanding that that's like a ways off, it's not, um, it's not coming tomorrow, even though it's needed yesterday. Um, but this is this is where we're at right now. And Sarah, that, can I just add to that? Absolutely, please do, Lashonda. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, the way that this is currently structured, um, per the recommendation from the task force, and the way we've been working in collaboration with the subcommittee members, um, Kristen and Sarah and others is for it to be housed with the city of Richmond. So these are dates that we are very aspirational. Like we are really trying to collectively work to meet some of these targets, but I want to be really open, transparent, and honest. This is a, you know, sometimes city government can be a little slower than we would like for it to be. And we are going to be moving as expeditiously as we can um, to, to meet these targets, but please give us some grace um, because we want to make sure this program is right in case we don't exactly meet these, uh, meet these dates. But we will continue to keep everyone uh, posted and updated. Uh, and, but I just wanted to ask for some, some grace um, and space to be able to make sure we develop and implement because there's a few steps that will need to happen um, internally in government. So I just wanted to add that, but thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, LaShonda. Um, so for the next and final part of our conversation tonight, we want to do the Q&A. Um, and so what questions do you have? Please put them in the Q&A box. I saw some questions in the chat, um, tried to message folks to ask them to put their questions in the Q&A box so we can have them all there because the chat gets lost. So if um, if we haven't answered your question or if you have a new one, please, please, please put that in the Q&A box now. And in the meantime, um, we can uh, go ahead and look at the questions that have already been asked and answered. Um, so Jane asked if the slides can be emailed to us and uh, Lupe said that they'll be uploaded on the website tomorrow morning. So if you look at the reimagining public safety um, you look at the Reimagining Public Safety website, which she linked there, then you'll be able to get all these slides tomorrow morning. And the next question from Diana was, how are we going to communicate this program to the Richmond community? Um, LaShonda, you answered that one. Do you want to answer that one a little bit? Sure. Um, so what I, I did my best to answer it. I think we will use all the avenues that we have available to us as um, local government so that, but we will also do that in collaboration and partnership and community with community, with community-based organizations, with uh, CBOs, as well as government service providers. We understand that CBOs and service providers have that connection with community and those that are in need of the service. And so we wanna make sure we're working with them, um, but we are really open um, to ideas, thoughts, suggestions about how we can make sure once this program is developed and ready to go, that we are reaching those who need it. Anyone who knows me knows I'm going to have the table at the event <laughs> with, the, 
right? All of that, right? We, 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 we table, outreach. yes. <laughs> All right. Um, another question was, um, are we connected to the Contra Costa A3 hub? Um, so I answered that one live, but just- I don't get ready because it's already dark. Um, just uh, repeating that we are working with them um, and we're still figuring out exactly what that partnership is like, but we're um, meeting regularly and will have a partnership. Uh, another question was some uh, Jacqueline had the comment that two people seems inadequate for the demand. Um, will there be volunteers to grow the team? And LaShonda responded that we were thinking of two people per team, um, partially so that we can maximize the number of teams that we have. Um, and so we haven't um, we haven't decided yet um, how many teams we'll have, um, but thinking two people per team as an adequate response. Um, just seeing a question in the chat, if you can pop that in the Q&A, then we'll be able to answer it. Um, another question was, what are the standard and qualifications for saying someone is 5150? And so basically the legislation says that um, a 5150 hold can be issued when a person as a result of a mental health disorder is a danger to others or to themselves or gravely disabled. So that's a really subjective um, guideline. It's basically if the person who is issuing the hold believes that somebody is a danger to themselves or others, that's when that hold would be issued. Um, it's a 72 hour hold and it would, um, it's a 72 hour hold so that somebody can be assessed by a clinician. Um, another question comment was that county behavioral health specialists don't work 24 seven, 365. They usually work a swing shift seven days a week. They're also having a staffing shortage at the moment. What's the plan for 5150 holds in those circumstances? So the county's intention is to actually have behavioral health specialists working 24-7, 365. That's part of their anytime um, hope there. And uh, so they're, they're going to, they are going to have that available. Um, but if there aren't county staff available, then um, absolutely, you know, if anytime something doesn't work, there still is always the option of calling on RPD. We're not um, taking that away as an option, just providing other options. And so that kind of leads into the next question about how will responders stay safe if they find themselves in a violent or armed situation? Um, as we mentioned earlier, that's a place where it might be appropriate to call on the police um, if, there's, if there's a real threat of violence. Um, and then, then there is the opportunity to still call on police for that. All right, so we have some, um, some more questions here. Um, one of the questions is, um, so there's two that are kind of connected. Um, how will you monitor if the program is working and how will success be defined with regard to recordable data? Um, so that is, that's something that we're working on. Um, one of the pieces is that we know is going to be part of it is evaluation, um, uh, getting, getting responses from anyone who's served by the program to find out what their experience was like and find out what the outcomes are. Um, so, you know, there's the assessment in that moment, but then even more valuable is the assessment maybe a week or a month later. Like, was this helpful? Is Did this support you in this moment? Um, we're also going to look at things like how many, um, how many calls are, is RPD still responding to? Are there, they, are we actually diverting calls away or are there, are we, is this program dealing with new situations that previously weren't addressed by anybody and the, the situations that RPD had handled are still being handled by them. Um, we'll also look at, you know, people who are using the program um, do, are, who are repeat users, um, who are, 
who are calling for services regularly, like what does their progress look like? Um, is this somebody, is, is the program helping? So that is, um, I know that that's an incomplete answer and isn't really like super concrete, but that's kind of where we're at right now. And that's another, that's one of the pieces of the program design that we're really working on um, firming up. Yeah, can I mention that I, I don't, in the introduction, I don't know that it was clear that Officer Smith is from dispatch and that he, we've been looking really closely at data with him and we know the data in the past and now, and you know, that's part of, for calls, for what the officers are currently responding to calls and they know which places they repeatedly, you know, have to show up for, for, for the same kind of mental health behavioral health issues and you know so this is we're working with RPD that he's part of the implementation team so I just want to make that clear and we're looking at data all right um Another question that I'm seeing here is um, how will we work with CBOs that are already doing this work in Richmond? Um, so some of the ways that we'll be working with folks is both in outreach, uh, making sure that people who are doing this work, that I'm, this work meaning supporting people through mental health and substance use challenges um, that they're that they know and that their folks know about this as a resource so making sure that we're um, working together on that and then also in referrals you know really like making sure that there's a strong partnership between staff of this program and staff at um, local organizations so that when someone comes when when the program the team goes out and works with somebody, the staff will be able to say, oh, you have this need, here's this organization that is like already doing exactly that. We don't need to invent that for you. That's already happening. Here's how you access it. Um, so those are two, two big ways that, the, that we're gonna work together with those programs. And, oh, go for it, Kristen. Someone's referred to, there's an in, gonna be an intake person that um, is assessing the call. And it, it could be that it's not really an immediate crisis call for the team to show up for, but that person needs a number, needs a resource, needs a community resource. Um, and so the intake person is going to direct that person to what, whatever the need is. We're not anticipating every call coming in is a crisis call. Does that make, yeah. Um, We're going to be working really closely but, with, with all of our community partners. Sorry. Go ahead. Mark. Question here in the chat that's asked if I'm working with a Jesse Souza, right? Is that, I think that's what it says. I, I'm not familiar who, with who that is. So um, the answer is no. <laughs> I don't know a Jesse Souza. Great. Just a reminder to folks, if you can put yeah. your questions in the Q&A box, then exactly. we can track them and answer them. Um, mm -hmm. And so another question from the Q&A box is... I, I'm sorry, go Sarah, for it, I clarify? Yeah. And I, I, I work for the city of Berkeley, so I don't know if that's... If I didn't do that in the introduction. I work for the city of Berkeley. I'm a case manager, so... Um, if that will clarify that question. Thank you. Great. So another question in the Q&A box is, has the city funded all of this adequately? So where we're at with funding right now is um, we have a million dollars allocated to the program for this year. That'll allow us to um, invest in some startup costs once we're uh, ready for that, get going with hiring. Um, it's and just make sure that we have enough funding to get the program up and running. The budget for the, the kind of year to year budget of what it's gonna to take to run the program every year, we're still working on finalizing the details of that. And that will be something that will be voted on with the budget um, as part of the budget discussions and voting um, during 
uh, in May, June during city council meetings. So we're not sure about funding um, beyond this year, but the, we currently have about a million to work with. All right, um, I noticed we have one person who has um, who has raised their hand, um, Antoine. So Antoine, do you um, wanna answer, ask your question live? I'll let you, give you the opportunity to speak. Yes, hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Antoine. Hello, hello everybody. How you doing? So for the last 10 years, um, I was with DeWanda when she went through that episode. Uh, I was with DeWanda with uh, Ceasefire and saw the trauma that our community was going through. And I've always allocated, I still on the board of alcohol and other drugs. I'm the district one supervisor for AOP. And I've always told them that Richmond does not have any mental health services. They always said that they do. So they allocated, this is just a, some, some FYI, which y'all don't know. They allocated last year $57 million of untraced money that they had in their caucus. And Richmond only got $850,000 of $57 million, which was a crime. And now we are y'all trying to figure out how we're going to take uh, and fund the program to uh, further uh, our efforts around mental health services in, in, in our community. We got partnered with mental health to get that money to go along with the Measure X funds, but they're going to really control. And so you got to know where that, where that money is going to go to. Uh, but, um, but also FYI, Rich Minds has been in the schools and the projects. St. John's came in at the St. John's, uh, St. John's Pullman townhouses uh, and three high schools, uh, one high school and three elementary schools, reaching out with mental health service to this new coalition of services that we have called the Contra Costa Coalition of Services. Uh, sponsored by Rich Minds and uh, and it's a co coalition of uh, 15 providers that's uh, doing great work and, and and making noise. Now the county is paying attention to what we need. So just just FYI, keep your ears to the grindstone because we're coming to uh, partner with our city and our county to bring real meaningful services that a one-stop shop will work in our community uh, with rapid response, with uh, coming having groups. Come and have self care. That just to, like y'all said, the one stop uh, space, but it'd be a one stop shop for all mental health services for our community. You go know, because it takes two to six weeks to get an appointment with a therapist. That is criminal, you know. Um, so we need to fix that problem. And um, I'll be here for here for y'all and to be able to partner with anybody that wants to help our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing, Anton. That sounds incredible. And um, you know, just uh, appreciating you highlighting also how little funding, um, especially around, uh, especially county funding for mental health actually gets to Richmond. Um, and that's a, that's a really big deal. Yeah, and no, that brings up, I mean, Ant Antoine has just been such, such a, um, amazing advocate for us on the county level and I'm, and we do not have enough people attending county meetings for mental health and addiction treatment and um, you know this has been a problem for years that we just don't have enough people that show up day of at I can't supervisors meetings when money decisions and budgets are being made and it's really a problem um, and you just you just keep at it, <laughs> Antoine. And I thank you so much. I've watched you do it the last you know since I've been at this for the last nine or ten years. But um, we really we really need people to to advocate. And and I attended some of the county meetings for this new redesign that they're doing with the Miles Hub, a Hall Hub, and um, a more equitable crisis system at the county level. And um, the city of Richmond didn't really have anybody regularly attending those meetings. They would kind of get reports back, but you know, other cities had folks at every single meeting, every meeting, you know, people from their city manager's office, people from their, their police departments. And, um, you know, and the people that show up, they're the ones that 
then build those relationships that, you know, they get the most, most help in their city and their community. That's how it works. So I really encourage everyone to, if you care about this issue, get involved, call into the, it's on zoom now, the supervisor, you know, call in and say you're from Richmond and this is what we need, or get on some of those boards, the county level, or, you know, thank you for, for speaking Antoine. All right, so we have another question here. Um, Luis is asking um, if we could talk a little bit more about how youth will be supported through the program, either at launch or in the future. And to be honest, that's an area where we have a lot more work to do. Um, we're kind of still sorting out what the, um, the legislation looks like there around how mobile crisis response works for youth. Um, and trying to, you know, find out, figure out how we can support the youth um, in our community, hopefully through this program, maybe through another program. Um, and so that's an area for, for future growth that we're, we're still working on. Thanks for asking that question, it's really important. All right, we don't have any more open questions in the Q&A. Um, one thing I just wanted to say, I saw mentioned in um, some comments in the chat is that this program isn't taking any options away from anyone. Anything that you have that has been working for you and that has been working for your community, absolutely still use that. The purpose of this program is to create additional options so that for people for whom it's not working, you have another place to call. If the, if the design of this doesn't sound like something that would help you and your family um, and you would rather, you know, use existing options, that is no problem. Um, that is still available to everyone. Just wanted to say that. All right, does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand if you wanna speak. Um, and if you have any questions that you want to put in the Q&A, we can still do those. Um, and yeah. Mr. Antoine, your hand is up, but I think it's already said what you had to say, right? Mr. Antoine? This chat is disabled, so you can't respond. Okay. Um, well, here, Antoine, I'll give you another opportunity to talk and you can let us know. Do you have something else you wanted to add? Yes. Yeah, so just some FYI. So, so the mental health budget is $98 million. Let me give y'all some information about mental health. So my predecessor, who our program is named after, Wayne Chapman, sat on the board for 10 years and no resources ever came he advocated for it to the day he had Richmond services. And we still ain't gotten out of them. And this Brown, this is why Rich Minds is doing what we're doing, bringing, bringing a, a coalition of services. It's not a competition anymore. That's why we can't get these services here because everybody needs to compete for them clubs when they got millions. And if we come together like a, like a fist, we can go get all that money because they've been denying us for years. Because we don't understand the, the, the concept, county geared their money. money through a coalition of services, wraparound services that's in one entity, and they give you that money that you're going after. And so we can't put a band aid on cancer. We have to build what we have with the million that y'all gonna put up, and then go after the county and demand our money from them to keep these programs going. Because we are a part of Contra Costa County and get John Joy to support it. So that's how it works. And with the youth services, the youth service bureau do a good job. They're part of the coalition. So we can't do it by ourselves. So in every entity of aspect of mental health, the coalition is going to, our coalition is going to cover that from, from kids to parents to youth. And that's how it has to be done because all families have issues. And if they don't have no help, like the young lady said, you know, she had, oh, she wanted somebody was to talk to, but nobody had a ear. The young man said in the 90s, they didn't have those services here. No, we didn't have them until the 2000s. Let's keep it real. So, I mean, let's keep it real while we on this, talking about forming this, this group, 
you know, it's not a it's, it's, it's not a snatch and grab. It's not a one hit wonder. Get a million dollars and cut and paste. Our people's lives are 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 are, 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 are is in jeopardy. So if you don't have no passion and no empathy for my city, go after this grant because it, it's it's not gonna look good on you when you cut and paste and get that money and don't serve nobody because that's what we've been used to in Richmond. They get paid and we get played and it's not going down no further on alone, not alone with our state of Richmond anymore. We're gonna use those monies, services to serve our community and get our people in, under what they call health and wellness. That's the verb we're starting to use it now. We want everybody healthy and we want everybody to be well, one day at a time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Antoine. All right, so not seeing any of their hands. We're at 724. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, just really appreciating everyone who came out on a Wednesday night to spend your time learning about this and, um, and hearing from our panelists. And big thanks again to Erin, Mika, and Delanda for participating tonight. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you thank all. you very much. Yes, thank you to our panel members. I just have to give a special thank you uh, to Marcus for jumping in and being our, our MC for the evening. Thank you. And to uh, our the task force members, to Sarah and um, Kristen. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with both of you and uh, you bring a lot of knowledge and expertise and experience and heart to this work. And so thank you for that. And then to uh, my fellow city staff, uh, thank you. So thank, thank you, you LaShonda. Yeah. Thank you. The love fest. Thank a you all. Huge <laughs> thanks to LaShonda, who has been just like a rock through all of this. LaShonda <laughs> is you. incredible. Yeah, we have a great team and we work well together. And we also are, since we're this whole program in development, this was also a listening session for us tonight. We were taking the staff taking notes and we're listening. We got our ears open and you know, so we're we're really um, we're really grateful for all of you showing up and, and you're helping develop this this new city program. Much appreciation to all for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks again. Bye. <laughs> Bye.